Wow. <laughs> I'll get your blood flowing. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. You don't know that old hymn. It's a wonderful old hymn. And we certainly did it up with a lot of um, uh, spice from south of the border this morning. You know, jazz is an American flavor. It originated here, right here in this uh, city of New Orleans. And it is an American art form. But the Latin American culture has done more to add to the influence of jazz than any other country. And uh, so this morning we're going to kind of celebrate that. We started with some Latin American uh, samba beat. And now we're going to go to what's called a bossa nova beat. We're going to sing a couple of our good old favorite hymns with a little bit of a bossa nova. So we're going to take it a little south of the border. Let's stand and join together. Savior like a shepherd lead us. Mm-hmm. 
belt loop or your hand. You've done it before with your children, haven't you? When they're all feisty and kind of running around, just stick your finger through that belt loop on the back of the belt and they keep trying to run away, can't figure out why they can't get away. And they're so secure in your arms that they don't have a clue that you're there. But you've also done the other thing, haven't you? Had that child reach up to your hand to want to grab your hand when the child knows, wants to hold his daddy's hand, wants to hold his mama's hand, wants to know he's safe. Wants to know with all those big legs, that's all he can see around, he's going to be okay. You've had that child reach up to grab your hand, haven't you? Well, is God grabbing a hold of your belt loop or your hand? It's amazing how easy it is even for us as ministers to think of God the most whenever we need Him the most. Instead of just seeking to always hold hand, hold onto that hand with great great strength. You are never out of God's grip. It's all a matter of whether you want Him to hold your hand or your belt loop. He's always going to hold on. He's never going to let go. And He'd prefer your hand. But He's still got your belt loop. I'm going to ask Dr. Reggie O.J. if he would come and join me up here at the front to lead us in a word of prayer. Dr. O.J. is the newest member of our faculty. His uh, career as a seminary professor is now approximately two hours old, and we're delighted to have him with us. He is our new director of the Doctor of Ministry program. Uh, Those of you might be interested in further training after you finish a basic seminary degree may want to talk with him one day. I do have a word of advice, guys, uh, though, for those of you in the MDF program. Please don't talk to your wife in the next two weeks about the next degree that you want to earn. Just kind of let her know you're glad to finish this one. Dr. O.J., you come and lead us in a word of prayer. Good morning, Lord. We're so thankful to be in your presence again today. We're thankful that you're a God who answers prayer, a God who forgives our sin, a God who rewards our faith. We're here today, Father, just to take a time out because we need what we're about to hear from your Word. And we're so respectful of all of the elements of worship that we would dare not minimize any of them. Lord, we just have so much to be thankful for. And we want to come into your presence today with gratitude and with thanksgiving and with an open and learning heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you sit down, turn to somebody next to you and just remind them the hand is better than the belt loop. Would you do that, please? Thank you so very much. We're delighted to have you with us today. We have some special guests on campus today. Many of you will recall what a hard decision you faced when you were deciding where to go to seminary. And as you began to have this great cold sinking fear that God was leading you to New Orleans and you weren't real sure you were excited about that, one of your real struggles was knowing how hard a city New Orleans was. And so famous for sin and so famous for ungodliness and so famous for a wildness that just never has made Baptist and evangelical Christians very comfortable. And you know how hard that decision was to say, okay, God, I'll go. I'm not real thrilled about it, but uh, I will follow your leadership and I will go to New Orleans. Well, I'm so delighted that we have some senior adults who aren't intimidated at all by the city of New Orleans. We're delighted to have with us senior adults from two churches who have come to our city specifically to help us tell our city about Jesus Christ. And they've been spending several days here going out in our neighborhoods and on our streets and working with the kids and the adults of this community and doing everything they can to tell them about Jesus. We have the folks from Longview Heights Baptist Church in Olive Branch, Mississippi, and the Council Bluff Baptist Church uh, from Oklahoma, Bethany, Oklahoma. And we're delighted to have you folks here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope every time you look over and see some of these precious senior adults, you remember two things. Number one, this is the generation 
that built the cooperative program, that literally built this seminary and made the Southern Baptist Convention what it is today. And we stand on the shoulders of some great people who have loved Jesus with an incredible passion and invested their life, their money, their resources, their time, built their world around the things of God. And we're always honored to have them in our presence. And I hope as you also look over, you'll remember to be challenged that you never do go off the clock as a Christian. That God always has more for us to do. As long as He gives us breath, there are ways we can serve Him. And thank you for being that living illustration for us this day. It's been a wonderful week celebrating the wonderful heritage of New Orleans and jazz music. This is the birthplace of jazz. And it has such a great compatibility, in my opinion, with our Christian faith. It holds some wonderful lessons, although it did not emerge out of a Christian context. You see, the, the essence of jazz, in my little simple-minded understanding, is a very simple thing that connects very thoroughly with my understanding of the gospel. You see, in the classic jazz set, a jazz ensemble, they will take a theme, a song, they will play that song, and then there'll be a spot where every instrumentalist in that jazz ensemble will go around and will do a solo improvising around that theme. And they rarely do the same thing twice. You hear the thread of a song you recognize, but you hear the individual variations working around that common theme. That's what it's like in the body of Christ. We have the same gospel, but God calls each of us to particular ministries. He gives each of us a diversity of gifts. We all have our own contribution to make to the work of the body of Christ. And as we've been celebrating the use of jazz for the worship and glory of God this week, I hope that you will remember it all revolves around that individual improvisation around the common shared theme and be challenged that God has called you, He has gifted you for a wonderful life of service to Him. What He put in you is what He wants out of you. We can hardly wait to see the improvisation you're going to do on the gospel of Jesus Christ as you share it in the manner God has called you to share it. Our preacher for the day is Dr. Jim Shaddix. He continues his series in Colossians. We'll look forward to hearing him. Next week will be our last week in chapel on Tuesday. We will have our celebration of excellence when we recognize some outstanding students uh, and faculty here at our school who have had wonderful years. And then on Wednesday, Dr. Robert White, the head of the Georgia Baptist Convention, dynamic, wonderful preacher. You're going to really enjoy him. And then the last sermon from Dr. Shaddix on the series in Colossians. It's going to be a great week. Let's turn our hearts now towards worship and praise in the glory of God. Wow, Dr. Kelly, a theology of jazz. I've been validated. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. It's, it's interesting how you learn such things from uh, all different kinds of walks of life. And, and uh, the, the thing that we just find enjoyable, we realize that there's a spiritual truth there. It's great stuff. All right. Jesus is all the world to me. 
Hadn't this, hasn't this group been incredible this week? Let's tell them one more time how much we appreciate it. What a fun time. Let me ask you to open your Bibles to Colossians, the third chapter. Colossians chapter 3. We want to think about the subject this morning. He is enough for our families. He's enough for our families. You're going to have to bear with me today. I have a little bit of a cold. and I know Dale Carnegie has said if you have to get up and apologize for your voice, you probably ought not to get up. But I don't know that he knew what it meant to have a fire in your bones either for preaching the Word of God. So we're going to give it our best shot. I have to tell you that uh, when we come to Colossians chapter 3 at the close of this uh, Jesus and all that jazz week, I'm a little bit uh, intimidated and feel a bit out of place and underqualified. Uh, Rick got up and preached uh, the other day about those questions out of Hebrews 11 and about the reality that sometimes all we have is our questions. I remember when he was telling Wayne uh, Barber and I about what he was going to preach before the service. Wayne uh, turned to me and said, man, that is so cool. He said, because that so dovetails into what I'm going to say on Wednesday. And, and then he got up and he talked about us needing a, a, a guide instead of a, a road map and, and how we don't have all the answers and we can't see all of the stuff. And, and so I went back and I began to think about what I was going to preach on this week and Realize that we were going to be at this wives submit yourselves to your husbands and husbands love your wives and children obey your parents and it just seemed like it didn't fit as well as the other two messages. But you know, Wayne, the more I thought about it, the more I thought there is a relationship between that stuff that they talked about and this issue of the family relationships between husbands and wives and parents and children and and bond servants who in that day would have been considered part of the household and the masters that uh, that governs them. In fact, it made me think with regard to some of those questions about some of you, some of you that come to seminary and, and you come single and, and many of your friends come single and and then all of a sudden you begin to see some of your friends get a ring on their finger and, and uh, you, you, you see some of them get, get married. How many of you have asked the question, when, Lord? When, when, when is my time coming? Or some of you that are married, the first time you saw you guys, saw your wife without their makeup on, you asked the question, why? Uh, why? Uh, you know, uh, uh, translated today, what was I thinking? You know, and... Uh, <clears throat> Some of you ladies who had that vision of a knight in shining armor who was going to ride in, sweep you off of your feet, and, and he was going to be your hero all the days of your life and provide for you and, and, and protect you, and then all of a sudden you begin to deal with the realities of uh, uh, dirty underwear laying around and toilet seats left uh, up, and you begin to ask a lot of questions of the Lord. I think there's a relationship, and I thought about Wayne's sermon when I was thinking about where I am in life trying to navigate raising teenagers. And uh, I'll tell you, Wayne, that uh, issue of uh, God's wisdom is not my wisdom. I'm, I'm all over that because uh, I need it so desperately uh, in, in this day and time. So I, I don't know. Maybe there's a connection along the way for Colossians chapter 3. We're talking about the sufficiency of Jesus Christ in the book of Colossians. And we've seen that He is sufficient for our pleasure. We've seen that He is sufficient for our our truth. And we we saw last week about His sufficiency for our conduct. And I'm encouraged today as a husband, as a father, as a parent, that He is sufficient for our families, aren't you? Because we live in a day when the family is under attack. And we're trying to reconcile so many different things. Our task this morning is not just to think about husbands and wives and parents and children and to think about uh, uh, bond slaves and masters and maybe applying some of of those principles to the employer-employee relationships that we have. There is this incredible tension that we live in in these walls here to take that information, our task being today to take it and apply it to the minister's family. And that is a whole different ballgame. It's you know the pressure you're under, don't you? 
You know, the pressure you're under as a minister of the Gospel or the spouse of one who's been called to ministry as a vocation. All of the regular stresses that are on the family and the culture in which we live are multiplied many times when you add this issue of the call to Gospel ministry into the mix. And I don't even have to go into the stats with you this morning of the number of ministers' families that are falling apart and the divorce rate that is taking place and spouses who are just throwing up their arms and and giving up and children of ministers who are choosing a direction other than that in the way that they were raised. And it's not new to us, is it? Some of the greatest men and women of God through the ages have been down the same path and dealt with some of the same issues. Billy Graham in his autobiography wrote this, Ruth says that those of us who are off traveling missed the best part of our lives, enjoying the children as they grew. She's probably right. I was too busy preaching all over the world. Only Ruth and the children can tell what those extended times of separation meant to them. For myself, as I look back, I now know that I came through those years with the poor, uh, with the poor both psychologically and emotionally. I missed so much by not being at home to see the children grow and develop. The children must carry scars of those separations too. And then he said this, I now warn young evangelists not to make the mistakes that I did. It wasn't new to Billy Graham though. John Wesley's marriage was a catastrophe. He and his wife, historians tell us, were far from happy in their relationship with one another. His wife, Mary, detested Wesley's dedication to the work. And he'd often travel for six or seven months at a time only to come home for one night and then to be off again. He was extremely jealous of other women whom John had, with whom John had contact and often intercepted correspondence with them. One of the biographers, Tyreman, writes that on one occasion she seized his letters and other papers and put them into the hands of such as she knew to be his enemies that they might be printed as presumptive proofs of illicit connections. Wesley's wife would periodically leave him until finally separated from him in 1776. Wesley spent the remainder of his life alone. And historians tell us of the relationship between the great evangelist Billy Sunday and his children that they despised him so much that after his death, one urinated on his grave. How are we going to avoid that? What is it that we're going to do in order to make sure that that doesn't happen in our homes and in our families? Colossians chapter 3 is not the only place that we find part of the answer, but we do find therein some principles that would help us to be the men and women of God that He has called us to be. And by His grace and His sovereign hand, we can trust as we align ourselves with the principles that are in Scripture in this passage and in other passages that we put ourselves in a position Not only to have marriages and homes that survive, but have marriages and homes that that thrive. Here's what Paul wrote to the Colossians in verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there's no partiality. And then in verse 1 of chapter 4, Masters, Give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a Master in heaven. I want to approach the development of this passage of Scripture this morning from a little bit different standpoint as opposed to just walking straight through it. I'd like to take a step back and I'd like for us to look at it and consider it in its context. And I also want to make some parallels with 
uh, a parallel passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. And so if you just hold your hand here in Colossians and flip over and find Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to go back and forth between these. Because you see, I think it is imperative that we understand these passages of Scripture together and we understand them in the context of where they come in each of these books so that we know what exactly God is saying to us through His Word. What I want to do is I want to call your attention this morning to four guiding principles in Colossians chapter 3, taking from its placement in the context of the book of Colossians, looking at its developments and see if we can determine what the Lord may say to us. Let me go ahead and give them to you. First of all, the principle of representation. Secondly, the principle of relationship. Thirdly, the principle of responsibility. And fourthly, the principle of reciprocity. Now let's talk about them individually. Look at Colossians chapter 3. And I want you to think with me about the principle of representation. This is the key to our understanding what the Apostle Paul is saying in this passage of Scripture, in this, this reality, this truth that is so often misinterpreted and so often neglected and so often abused. Here's the principle of representation. Family members must relate to one another as representatives of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't get that, you can't play. It guides the whole thing. It guides a right understanding and a right interpretation of the individual roles that are dictated in this passage for wives and for husbands and for children and parents and for bond slaves and for masters. Let me show you what I'm talking about. We begin here in the book of Colossians and we look at where this paragraph comes in the context. You remember where we were last week, those of you that were part of our study? You remember us talking about Jesus Christ being sufficient for our conduct and, and we looked at, at the need to live in this life using the resources of the next life and how Paul talked about in verse 1, seeking those things which are above where Christ is sitting, setting our minds on that. And only when we do that are we able to conduct ourselves in a godly manner down here. Do you remember the very last verse, verse 17, in our consideration? Do you remember what Paul said? Look at it. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all, watch it now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember we ended our study by talking about the fact that Paul speaks here of us being called to do everything we do, everything we say, every way that we act, in the name of the Lord Jesus as His representative keeping in mind that we are expressions of His life in this world and we are the ones who are called to allow Him to live out His life through us. Everything we do, everything we say, we're to do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had been real specific about that in the preceding paragraph. Do you remember in verse 11 there where he says there's neither Greek nor Jew in this Christ thing, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free? But watch this. Christ is all and He is in all. Right there, at that point, before he begins to talk about the things, the characteristics we're to put on, he makes the foundational statement that it is all Him and it's because He is all and because He is in all. And then... He goes on to begin to talk about those character qualities that we immediately understand character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you put them on. You remember there in verse 12? Put on tender mercies and kindness. See if you can pick out something on this list that wouldn't be true of the Lord Jesus Christ. Humility, meekness, long-suffering. In verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, watch even as who? Christ forgave you, so you must also do. And then in verse 14, above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You see the context we come into this discussion about the family in? It is a discussion about the Christ life being lived out in and through us 
and the reality that what we are called upon to be is representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to hang your hat on that because it is incredibly important in understanding the, the mandates for wives to be submissive and husbands to love their wives and children to obey their parents and, and parents not to exasperate their children and so forth. Why? Because we are representatives of Him. But you see, we get even a little more clear explanation in Ephesians as Paul talks about this. Flip over there just a couple of pages back in your Bible and let's think about it from this perspective. Most Bible scholars think that Colossians was probably written just a little bit before Ephesians. And so the second time that Paul puts this on the table, he expands on it a little bit and helps us to get into his mind with a little bit more of what he's talking about. You understand that we're dealing with pretty much the same context? Back in chapter 4 of Ephesians, Paul talks about putting off the old and putting on the new. He deals with the same thing. And then he comes down in verse 32 with an example. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then he says this in verse 1 of chapter 5. Therefore, you be imitators of God as dear children. In the language of the New Testament, it's the word from which we get our word icon, that which represents the real thing. And he says, you be an icon of the Christ life. You be an imitator of Him. And it's in that chapter after Paul has made this statement that he comes to verse 22 in Ephesians and he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then he tells us why. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. If you're even entertaining the possibility that this is a demands a cultural interpretation, you're wondering, well, didn't He just say that in that culture? Wives needed to be submissive because it was the order of the day, but not today. Notice the parallel. Notice the comparison. Paul says, why do you do this? And husbands, you do this because you are imitators of a relationship between Christ and the church. And Christ is the head of church. Now, I want to ask you something. Is Jesus still the head of the church today? Yes, He is. You know what that means? The man is still the head of the woman. If we're going to interpret it culturally, we're going to have to interpret it all culturally. And Jesus gave us, the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, an eternal reality to hang our hats on here. And he says to us all the way through this passage of Scripture, there is this comparison of the man representing Christ and the woman representing the church. Now, this is so cool. This will change your marriage. So I want you to come in here real close and listen to this. Actually, one of my colleagues said not to say that today because I have a cold and you don't need to get too close because uh, you might uh, catch that. I want you to, I want you to notice how Paul develops this thing in Ephesians. He goes on down and he keeps going back and forth in verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Parallel after parallel after parallel. And then in verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own body, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members. You see the parallel of his body, of his flesh, of his bone. And then he does something incredibly interesting. He quotes the verse that's read at all of our wedding ceremonies. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Now remember what's happening. He's making a parallel between the husband-wife relationship and the relationship between Christ and the church. He said, your representatives, be icons, be imitators. And then he says in verse 31, quoting this verse, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Watch verse 32. Don't miss this. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I just want you to notice where Paul makes that statement. Right on the heels of Genesis 2.24. Right on the heels of a foundational verse for the marriage relationship. Paul says, listen to me, this is a great mystery. 
Something covered up in the Old Testament, but now revealed in the New Testament. This is a great mystery, but watch it now. I'm speaking of Christ and the church. And I want to give you a whole new motivation for your relationship with your spouse this morning. It is not primarily about companionship. It is not primarily about even relationships so that you can have someone to walk through life and ministry about. It is not primarily for the purpose of bearing children and raising them up in a godly home. All of those are byproducts. But the number one motivation of the marital relationship in our day and time is to represent for people in this day the relationship between Jesus Christ and His church. Now, do you understand that puts a whole new spin on divorce? It puts a whole new spin on the magnitude of family breakdown. It puts a whole new spin on the urgency of fathers and husbands and wives and mothers being what God called them to be. Because we are the music video of the world of the testimony of Jesus Christ and His relationship to the church. Now, if that's the case, why should it surprise us then that the Apostle Paul would say, now, ladies, you play your role because you're a picture of the church in submission to Christ. Men, you play your role because you are the world's picture of the way that Jesus Christ loved His church. We need to understand That there is a principle of representation and that is is each and every one of us in the same way children aligning themselves in obedience under their parents and parents treating them like Christ would treat His church. Another video, another picture. Family members must relate to one another as representatives of Jesus Christ. Let that drive everything you do. Principle number two. It's the principle of relationship. And here it is, family members must relate to one another in view of their relationships with Jesus Christ. Now Paul in Colossians, as he does in Ephesians, seems to speak first to the family members or the members of the household who had the greatest tendency or the greatest, were at greatest risk of being abused in the household. And that would be those who are called to be under, to align themselves under in submission, in obedience with the children and the the bond servants. And so he speaks to them first. I want you to notice a common denominator that runs all the way through his injunctions to those three parties. And I don't believe this means that the men uh, and the parents are exempt or the masters are exempt, but he seems to be saying, look, I know you stand at the greatest risk of of being abused and and having this misrepresented, so I want you to I want to give you a new perspective. Look at it, verse eighteen. Wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Notice he doesn't tell wives you to align yourselves under your husband's headship as is fitting in the relationship between you and your husband. And look down when he talks to the children down there in verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to your parents. Well, we hope so, but that's not what he said. This is well-pleasing to you as children. Well, not a chance. What does he say? It's well-pleasing to the Lord. You have the same thing in verse 22 with the bond servants at the very end. He says, you do this fearing God. And then in verse 23, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. And then in verse 24, he said, you will receive a reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. You know where we get bogged down a lot of times? in misrepresenting, misunderstanding, and reacting against the roles, especially women and children and those who would be aligned under supervisors. You know where we get off base of it? Is that we're too short-sighted in our consideration of the relationship. And we compare our actions or we dictate, we allow our actions to be dictated by the nature of the physical relationship, the relationship between us and our spouse or us and our parents or us and and, and those who supervise us. 
And so Paul takes it to a different level. He says, let me give you a new perspective. This is not about the physical relationship. That is not what drives how you relate to those in this life. What drives it is your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he he puts a new set of lens on this thing. And he says, ladies, do this because it is fitting to the Lord. It is fitting in your relationship with Him. He says, children, you do this because it's well-pleasing to Him. Maybe not to you, but to Him. Servants, bond slaves, employees, you do this because you serve the Lord. Paul was smart enough to know the husbands were not always going to treat wives like they should. The parents were not always going to treat children like they should. The masters were not always going to treat slaves like they should. So he says, you apply the principle of relationship and you relate to one another in view of your relationships with Jesus Christ. Principle number three. The principle of responsibility. Here's the principle of responsibility. Family members must be motivated by responsibilities and not rights. Family members must be motivated by responsibilities, not by rights. Did you notice that about both the Colossians text and the Ephesians text? This is not a list of rights. Now, rights are implied. They are implied, but each of us are called to a particular role, not from the perspective of the rights that are implied, but the responsibilities or the duties that we are called to in each and every one of them. Think about it. Wives have a right to be loved by their husbands, do they not? But Paul doesn't speak to you ladies and say, ladies, you ought to be motivated in your relationship by what your husband owes you. Nor does he say to the husband, men, you have the right for your wife to voluntarily align herself under your leadership. That right is implied. But men, he doesn't speak to you in that way. In fact, though we would be very careful about suggesting that any of us should ignore any part of the Word of God, it is important to understand the address E in each of these situations. He says in verse 18, wives, this is for you. Husbands, tune out in other words. This is not your deal. It's not your deal to go around demanding your wife to be submissive to you and calling her in line. It's a responsibility that she has to do that. But Paul addresses the woman. Ladies, you have the right to be loved by your husbands just like Christ loved the church. But verse 19 is not talking to you. He addresses husbands. And it is not yours to go around pointing that out to your husband and demanding him to do that and to treat you like Christ would love the church. Not your deal. This is not a part of the Word of God that is written to you. We're dealing with responsibilities and duties. Wives, you have a responsibility in the language of the New Testament to align yourselves under your husband's headship. doesn't mean he makes all the decisions, but it certainly means that if it came down to a disagreement after you've worked through those things, that you need to go with what he says. It doesn't mean that a woman's desires are never satisfied or her wishes are never granted, but it does mean that the husband's vocation and profession ought to be that which gives direction to the home and to the family. Men, we're called upon to love our wives. That's our responsibility. To love our wives and to not be bitter toward them. The Jewish household during this time as well as in the Greco-Roman household. Women were considered almost property, not much better than slaves and Oftentimes, uh, eight in separate rooms and, and there was just all kinds of stuff that almost uh, considered them to be a, a property of, of, of ownership. And, and there was a tendency on many men's parts to take that for granted and to abuse that uh, more than it already was abused and to, to, uh, to convey bitterness and hostility. 
Of course, in Ephesians, Paul puts it all in perspective when he gives us something to compare it to. And he would say to us, not only you ought not to be bitter toward them, but you ought to love them in the same way that Christ loved the church. Have you ever thought about how Jesus loved the church? The Ephesian passage tells us about the pinnacle, doesn't it? He gave Himself to the church. He sacrificed Himself. And that tells us a whole lot, man. It moves this outside of consideration that submission to a husband means that you're to be treated like a doormat or that you don't have any say-so in the home. That's incredibly ridiculous in light of this comparison that Paul makes to love our wives like Christ loved the church. Jesus provided for the church, didn't He? He did what was necessary to provide for the physical and emotional and spiritual needs. Jesus taught the church, did He not, men? He nurtured them spiritually into His image by teaching them the Word of God. Do I need to remind you, at one point, shortly before His death, Jesus got down on His knees and took a wash basin and a towel and He washed the feet of the church. Now, that will transform your marriage. Why don't you try that when you get home tonight? Puts it in a completely different perspective. That is a responsibility that we have, gentlemen. It is not ours to claim the right that we have for our wives to submit to us. Children's responsibility and duty is to be obedient and to continue to do that in the language of the New Testament. Not selectively, but in all things, he says there in verse 20. And fathers, and many scholars think that because this word is a generic word that can be used to refer to both parents as well, that he may be speaking to both here, are not to provoke your children. He means to exasperate them. To be so on top of them and so overlooking them and so strict that they lose their spirit. James Dobson talks of shaping the will without breaking the spirit. He's speaking of this reality. And I would say to you as transparently as I can this morning, it is the biggest struggle that I have as a father. Because of my zeal for my kids to be righteous and to be godly. And we are susceptible to that in ministry, in the church, in home, because we know we live in glass houses and people are looking. And we don't want anybody to think less of our family than the very best. And there is an extra temptation, folks, for us to be especially hard on our children and not to let them be children as they're growing up to the point that we break their spirits and they lose their will for anything, including godly living. That's what Paul's talking about. It's a responsibility that we have in raising our children. And then with bond servants, the responsibility to align ourselves under our masters, not doing it just when they're looking with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity. That means when they're not looking. Oh, the work ethic and the workplace today that so needs to be revived and revolutionized and, and regained because it has reached an all-time low point when there seems to be no integrity in service and, and, and no desire to do the right thing and to be the very best. One commentator says in our suggestion that we need to be careful about making the parallel between bond servants and masters and employers and employees if bond servants who were called to do this without any say-so in it and without re any remuneration, were called to this level of living, so should those of us who get paid to do what we do and have a say-so in the jobs that we take. All the more it ought to apply to us. Not the responsibility that we have. And to masters, your responsibility in verse 1 of chapter 4 is to do what's just, what's right, and what's fair, knowing that we have somebody governing us as well. You know why I think Paul spoke in terms of responsibilities instead of rights? Because rights are so much easier to abuse, are they not? Responsibilities are a safeguard. You know, every time I turn on my computer now, it seems that I have email that uh, it will, will be a quick link to a pornographic site. Happens with my children and anybody that is in there. And about the time you think you've got it secure, somebody, uh, they, they create some way to get around the fire. And every time I see that, my heart breaks and it grieves and I say, that's not fair. It ought not to be that way. That's not what our Bill of Rights intended 
And it talked to us about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. But don't you wonder sometimes if where we have taken the Bill of Rights is to a place that it was never intended to go? Can you imagine, think with me about the Bill of Rights just for a second. Can you imagine if this document were about responsibilities instead of rights? Instead of that which people rose up and said, you owe me this. Because when we begin to demand that somebody owes us something, we have a tendency to twist it and to change it and abuse it. But can you imagine if some of these bills of rights were about responsibilities? Maybe they said something to the effect that we have the responsibility to pursue a knowledge of our Creator and make sure that we don't stand in anybody's way of pursuing that knowledge. Can you imagine if they spoke to us about the responsibility that we had in our printing and in our speech never to say anything or put anything in print that could be detrimental or damaging? There is a difference between rights and responsibility. Paul said for you, Christian, it's about responsibilities, not about rights. We don't build homes going around demanding our rights in the home. Finally, principle number four, the principle of reciprocity and We don't need to spend a lot of time here because it is the obvious, isn't it? Family responsibilities according to the Word here in this passage are reciprocal and they are not selective. We notice it immediately, don't we? He talks to the wives, submit to your own husbands, and then He talks to the husbands and says, you love your wives. I want to tell you, friends, I've never known a couple in a relationship in which the husband was loving the wife like Christ loved the church where that woman had a problem submitting to that man. And it'll be that way with our children. And it'll be that way. He gives an injunction, a mandate to one, and he turns around and gives it to the other as well. It's reciprocal, not selective. And all of us have been called to that. Let me challenge you this morning to take a new perspective in your family relationships. A perspective that calls you to be a representative of the relationship between Christ and the church. It's driven by your relationship with Him, not first and foremost by your relationship with family members. To be driven and motivated by responsibilities and not rights. And make sure you keep in mind that it's reciprocal and not selective. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank You that You are sufficient for all parts of our lives and ministries, including our family. God, give us grace. Give us grace that when we punch play in our homes, that the video that rolls is one on which the world sees what it means to be related to the person of Jesus Christ. For it's in His precious name we pray. Amen.